has been an active political life for the last 18 years. Uh, very recently, he quit the Biju Janata Dal uh, and decided uh, to go on his own, at least so far. Uh, his new book, The Latin's Maverick, uh, is an oxymoron of sorts. He's quintessentially, many people believe, the Latin's guy, and yet he calls himself the Maverick. Uh, let's begin the conversation then with Jay Panda. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Congratulations on your new book. Uh, I think it's the title that makes me a little curious, Lutian's Maverick, an oxymoron of sorts. Uh, Lutians has become a bad word. Uh, it's almost, uh, you know, it's, it's a word that nobody wants to be associated with and you bravely put it out there. Uh, are, are you telling me that you belong to Lutians and yet you're an outsider? Help me explain the title before I ask you any other questions. I think uh, you're close to uh, explaining it very accurately. Mm. Uh, you're right. Lutians is often being described as a bubble when people inside uh, have lost touch with the outside world. And this mm. is typical of political capitals. If you go to Washington, D.C., they talk about the Beltway, and people who live inside the Beltway don't have much connection with uh, the Midwest That's right. and other parts of the mm. country. So I have taken pride mm. in a, you know, I've been a parliamentarian for 18 years, so obviously I have one foot in Latians, in mm. Parliament. Mm. But I've always taken pride in having the other foot firmly in what I call real India, mm. in my constituency, in my state, and other parts of the country. Mm. Because I think these two need to work together. Often policy making in Delhi happens without a full appreciation of what is required on the ground. Mm. And sometimes on the ground, people have expectations that are very difficult to actually translate into policy in mm. Delhi. Mm. So my ambition has always been and my goal has always been to marry the two together. So one foot in Latians, one foot in real India, being a maverick in Latians. So what happens when the aspirations and expectations of people outside of Latians Delhi doesn't quite mirror in policy making? How do you then uh, make those aspirations be met? What happens when those aspirations are not being met? I think one of the single biggest differentiators mm. is economic well-being. Mm. Remember that famous slogan in Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign on the wall, it said, it's the economy, stupid, stupid yeah. right? Yeah. So you've seen this in other countries. Mm. China, over the past four decades, has kept all kind of popular uprisings at bay mm. because they have given high growth rates and improved standard of living to the people. So on the one hand, we in India have started doing that over the last 27, 28 years since we started economic reforms. Mm, true, yes. But that is a long-term effort. Mm. As far as a politician is concerned, I have discovered that if you are genuinely there with the people, mm. trying to help them, even if you don't always succeed, I think people appreciate that fact. You know, when you talk about the economy, and I was going to come to it later, but because you're talking about the economy right now, uh, we are less than six months away from general elections. Actually, four or five, wonder when they start. But uh, we are very, very close to general elections, and many people believe this is going to be a high-stake political battle. As somebody who understands electoral politics, you're not just somebody who lives in Delhi, elected to the upper house, understands the ways it means. Yeah, you understand electoral politics. Where is the polity of our country headed right now? I think the election is wide open. Compared to one year ago, mm. when the conventional wisdom was that Prime Minister Modi was headed for a second term, mm. I think today's conventional wisdom is that it's a real contest. What has happened in the last few months, especially with these state elections, and also changing dynamics in the opposition. On the one hand, you've seen a re-energized Congress. Mm. Uh, whatever you think about Rahul Gandhi, you can't deny that he has been persistent despite Congress having many setbacks over several years hmm. and he becoming the subject of memes, has, has uh, stuck it out and is today setting the narrative. Hmm. But you can't rule out uh, Prime Minister Modi even at this juncture because he is uh, the best communicator India has seen in politics since at least Vajpayee Ji, maybe, maybe for a long time. Hmm. So there is enough time, as you said, four to five months for anyone to take the initiative. It could be the prime minister and he could retake the initiative and set the narrative. Mm. It could be the leader of the Congress or it could be, as you, you're hearing now, that there is a Mahagat Bandhan again emerging, which was yes. uh, in the middle not working out. These are all important factors. I think it's a wide open contest. You know, you're absolutely right. About, say, eight, nine months back, not even a year, till about eight months back, it was Mr. Modi's election to lose. It looks like... There could be contenders, uh, you know, in the fray right now and serious ones at that. What do you think changed? Did the government lose the plot? Is there detachment from reality? Uh, is there too much centralization? What went wrong? 
Well, uh, on the one hand, many of the things that this Prime Minister has been focusing on mm. have far-reaching effect. For example, GST. Now, GST is a very good thing, mm. but it is something that will be appreciated in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Mm. Uh, it's not going to pay off within the first two or three years. And this was discussed even when GST was being Absolutely, debated. Yes. That it will initially cause pain and it has caused a lot of pain. So I think some of the streamlining of GST which is being done now, mm. the reduction of rates, the streamlining of the procedures, I think that should have been done a year ago. Mm. Then uh, It was a messy GST to sort of begin with. I think it was the least bad GST. You okay. know, if you could, uh, no other better GST could have passed because you have, to, you have to get so yeah, many yeah, people, people on board. On board. Mm. But the streamlining that is happening now mm. could have happened immediately after the passage sure. of GST. Mm. That is one aspect. Mm. Uh, the other aspect I think uh, you know, let us keep in mind that in the last 28 years of reforms that we have seen, mm. none of the truly reformist prime ministers got a second term. Mm. So, uh, Narasimha Rao, who got the first reform started, he didn't mm. get a second term. Mm. Uh, Vajpayee ji, who brought about enormous reforms with the thrust on infrastructure, mm. uh, gold, golden quadrilateral, he never got a second term. Now, whether, and I think Mr. Modi is the third truly reformist prime minister mm. in this era, whether he's going to get a second term is not easy. Uh, it depends on marketing the idea mm. that a lot of groundwork has been done. The results haven't started showing yet, but they will over the next five years. Has centralized decision making taken a toll on what could have been game changing economic reforms? And like you said, in the realm of executive decision making. The two biggest challenges that this government faces today mm. is joblessness and agricultural crisis, farmers crisis. Now, the irony is this. Mm. These are not new problems. These have been there for many decades. Uh, but perhaps this government also set the expectations very high. True. So now it comes to uh, the point where you have depend on the wisdom of the voters, whether they understand that these fundamental problems have been carrying on for a long time and perhaps five years is not long enough and mm. maybe a second chance should be given. Mm. Or maybe the voters will feel, by, but you told us you will solve it. And we've given you a full term, you haven't solved it. But do you believe the agrarian crisis or the rural stress, however you call it, and joblessness is going to be the mainstay of elections 2019? Yes, I think they will be the two biggest issues. Hmm. Uh, but I think it's too early to judge how voters will view it. Voters could very well feel hmm. that, look, yes, we haven't yet got resolution of these problems, but that some work has happened and a second chance be given. Or voters could say, we gave you a full five years and you haven't solved the problem. I think we are still too early mm. to come to that point. Uh, but fundamentally, I want to give you an example. Sure. You, a little bit earlier, you mm. said mm. about how reforms are difficult in India. Mm. So this goes back to that philosophy that good economics makes for bad politics. politics yes. Right? Yes. Not necessarily. And I have written about this in my book, yes, in Latin's have. Maverick, mm. several times. Mm. That the days are gone when you can just announce a policy and it will happen on its own. You have to sell it. True. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Mm. Prime Minister Modi has very effectively sold the idea mm. that the middle class should give up some of the subsidies such as on LPG gas. And a lot of people have. And he persuaded, mm. at, at the last count was more than a crore of Indians to voluntarily give up mm. the LPG subsidy. And that has been redirected to cash subsidies for really poor people True. who deserve it. Mm. So that has never got any pushback. Mm. Why? Because it was marketed. Right? Yeah. Now, in the previous government in the UPA, you saw many initiatives which were tried, which failed mm. because there was nobody marketing it. And even in this government, when Prime Minister Modi first became Prime Minister, mm. the very first bill he tried to pass was land reform. It was not marketed. There was enormous pushback and that idea had to be dropped. dropped yes. So that comes back to this thing, mm. whether it is Air India privatization, mm. whether it is giving up of subsidies by the middle class, such as LPG subsidies. How do you market it? Whether it is uh, GST and the pain that it causes initially, mm. it mm. requires the very head mm. of the government to market it and to say, bear with me, these will cause the initial difficulties but they will lead to a better future. I wonder if there's a dearth of marketing in this government. This most, to be people think, most people think that there is an overdrive of yes, marketing yes. by Prime Minister Modi. Mm. I think a lot of the marketing is there for political purposes. Mm. But as far as selling policy ideas, 
the example I can think of best is what I just told you, mm -hmm. LPG, mm -hmm. gas mm -hmm. uh, subsidy, uh, voluntary right. surrendering. Right. That is a great example. I think much more of that should have happened. Should have happened. Okay. Is populist politics going to take center stage in a run-up to 2019? I mean, you know, we were still baffling with, I mean, battling with the caste system and we were seeing uh, quota agitations and all of that happen. And now the government has announced there will be 10% reservation for the economically weaker in the upper caste as well. Uh, there are many who will say economic criteria perhaps is a better criteria. There are many others who will say, is reservation, you know, the tool for financial uh, upliftment? Should it not just be... Um, you know, social representation. What's your view on this? First of all, populism has a role in a democracy. Mm. We are not a country like China where nine people decide the what country's future mm. and the public's opinion doesn't really matter. Mm. So they don't have to be populist. They can take tough decisions and it has paid off. China sure. has done very well. Sure. Now we are a democracy, which means there will be certain populism. Mm. And to the extent that you don't want to do populism, uh, you want to do realistic policies, you have to market them as we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. But the fact remains, this is like a pendulum. If it swings too much one way, there mm -hmm. will be a correction. So in the previous era, you had a lot of populism. You had a lot of social sector expenditure and the economic growth rate fell. It crashed to 4.5%. Mm -hmm. There was a great deal of uh, angst in the country. Joblessness went up. And people then realized that populism alone was not the enough. Answer. And then uh, you got a reversal in electoral politics. Mm. Now, if you go too far to the other extreme mm. and you give no quarter to the urgent demands of the people, mm. that also will not be sustainable. So in a democracy, I think you have to find a balance between populism and rational policies. Mm. And you have to constantly market the rational policies. Fair point. Uh, but but back to the question on reservations, uh, is this going to yield any political dividend? Certainly it has a political resonance. Mm. Mm. Uh, it will perhaps serve part of the objective because clearly mm. there are many poor people from the, upper caste. the middle and upper caste who don't have reservations, who mm. suffer mm. Uh, and uh, it will to some extent correct that. But the whole reservation system, and one of the chapters I've written yes, in the book, yes. is that we need to re-examine. Uh, uh, you know, there are, there, there are some reasons that we must have reservations, because it's not just about economic. Right. It's, it's about bias, it's about discrimination against certain people, which yeah. has been there for age old, for centuries. Precisely. It's but social representation. But is democracy also. has corrected that to some extent, mm. and to some extent, First generation learners, mm. first generation participants in the workforce, mm. they face discrimination which has to be addressed with some kind of uh, policy, mm. whether it is affirmative action sure. or it is reservation or something. But our system has gone to an extent where second, second, third, fourth generation creamy layer people who are very well off getting that sort of benefit, it, it, is, uh, it creates an angst among poorer people who belong to so other So when you castes. look at that, economic criteria is perhaps the right criteria then? Well, it can't be the only criteria because of the sure. rationale for reservations, mm. but it does serve some purpose. Do you believe this, this Mahagatvandan that keeps getting spoken about or, you know, um, uh, the coming together of uh, uh, seemingly strange bedfellows, is this really going to be a real challenge for Mr. Modi? Or is he really going to be involved in duels across different states? It could be an SPBSP in UP, a, a, a Maya, a, you know, a Mamata perhaps in TMC, uh, the AIAD, a DMK kind of a metric in Tamil Nadu. Is that what real politics is going to be of 2019? The BJP has come into pole position only in the last five years, hmm. only after That's the true. 2014 yes. election. Yes. Because for nearly 70 years after independence, hmm. it was Congress which was in pole position true. even when it was not in government. That's right. But only now, in the last five years, BJP has become the largest party in the country, not mm. just in parliament, but in state governments, mm. in organization across the country. And it faces the same challenges that Congress faced traditionally, is it can succeed if the others don't combine. If the others combine, then it becomes a problem. True. Now, we have seen that the Mahagatbandan or any major combination of uh, opposition parties, mm. it has happened when you had by-elections in UP for one or two seats. Yeah, Gorakhpur and Phulpur. And they were effective. But when you had state-level elections, it couldn't happen because when you are dealing with many dozens of seats, it becomes harder to, to share the, the spoils. Yes. Right? 
Now we are talking about a national election mm. and it's not just dozens of seats, it's hundreds of seats True. across the country. True. It becomes that much more difficult. Mm. Mm. Now pre-election gutbandans are more effective but they're also that much more difficult to stitch together. To stitch together. Yeah. Today you are hearing uh, again a renewed effort mm. at a gutbandan in uh, UP. Mm. Mm. Now it could very well be mm. that you can have separate versions of such a gutbandan in different states mm. because you know this this Mahagadbandan in UP has really not that much relevance in South India. True. But yeah. there are others in Eastern and Southern India who have a different kind of relevance. Mm. So uh, it's possible that you could, uh, of course, if all were to get together, then it would send a kind of a message plus the arithmetic would be very compelling. Mm -hmm. But even if they all don't get together, if there are uh, state-wide state or region-wise mm. contests, uh, the arithmetic would still be very compelling. One of the things that I want to speak about, and I think you've written also in your book, is uh, the triple talaq thing. And, and I want to speak about two issues and ask you more, a more big picture question. Triple talaq uh, uh, was much debated, uh, you know, parliament and all of that. Do you believe, I mean, apart from the emotive issue around triple talaq, do you believe it has paved the way for a uniform civil code? And that is where, and that's the direction we're really moving in. I think we are coming to a third inflection point. Hmm. The first inflection point was independence itself, hmm. where because of the trauma, of the birth of our republic mm. because of the trauma of partition mm. several things were brushed under the carpet and left to be dealt with another day mm. so for example we decided the constitution gives equal rights to everybody mm. there followed reforms in in uh, old practices in among hindus and other religions True. but in certain uh, aspects of the minorities uh, group rights were mm. not changed mm. but a modern republic is about individual rights it's mm. not about group rights it's True. not about the right of a clan or a tribe or a religion it's and about for how long will you deny a woman a right in the name of group rights so yeah. so individual rights has to prevail mm. now it's in the directive principle mm. that we have to seek reforms in these areas a uniform civil code sure. Now, anybody who tries to do something towards achieving the directive principle sometimes are being accused of being communal, but that's mm. not fair. I think if you are trying to implement or legislate the directive principles, it's only as the constitution intended, it's only as the founding fathers I just intended. Think, I just think parts of the act could have been changed and so amended. So, you're talking yes. about the criminal aspect yes, of criminal it? Aspect, now, look, the know. second inflection point was 1986 hmm. because of the Shah Bano judgment. True. The whole project of providing universal individual rights to every Indian citizen went in a different direction. Mm, mm. Now, 33 years later, mm. we have come full circle True. and there's another change. So the answer to your question, mm. is the Supreme Court judgment on triple talaq, uh, is it going to pave the way to a uniform civil court? I think it opens the door. So far, the door on a uniform civil court had been closed. Fair point. At but least you, know, you think there's a foot in the Now the door, door has opened. Hmm. Doesn't mean it'll happen automatically. Hmm. But I think you are beginning to see the path forward. You can argue about whether it should have been criminal, not should have been criminal. But nobody should argue that doing away with triple talaq law was a Oh yeah, thing. absolutely. Nobody should argue that. I think parts of the act though could have been different. But you know, when I talk about women empowerment via triple talaq, how are you going to gauge the reactions of politicians across the political spectrum to the Sabri Mala judgment? I mean, I know, uh, and that really brings me to the point that where is it that the line of the courts end and that of faith begins? Because Sabri Mala also perhaps, and I, at least, you know, being a woman, I see it as a woman empowerment tool. Even if one woman in that community wants to go to a temple, why should she be denied that right? But, but you know, it's, it's far more complex than obviously the courts imagined it to be. So one of the reasons mm. I have been described by some people as a maverick mm. is that I'm willing to call a spade a spade. Mm. And one chapter is in fact devoted to this particular aspect. Mm. Mm. Let me explain. Now our constitution provides equal rights to each individual citizen mm. in their own, sure. own way, in, in their family lives mm. and all of that. Now when you come to worship, I believe an individual citizen should be allowed to worship as he or she pleases, except when you go to a group place of worship. Mm. Now a group place of worship, in my opinion, has to have consensus of that group. Uh, if it doesn't have consensus of that group, how? Do, uh, of course, if you, if you have uh, uh, sacrificial rituals at a temple, sure, that has yes. to be stopped because exactly. that's, that's something different. Mm. But if a religion consists of a group of people believing certain things, mm. then to tell them that no, you need to reform to be in line with 21st century, if you're doing it in a general sense in living in the real world, mm. it's a different story. When mm. it has to do with your 
civil laws such as marriage, divorce, etc. Uh, now you can, I don't think anybody should stop anybody from praying any way they want at their home. But to go to a group place of religion where the group has certain consensual rules, mm. I have a little wary about courts interfering in that. We can agree to disagree on this yes, one. Of course, I, I, I agree with most things that you say, but I think I vehemently disagree on this. But you know, that also brings me to a point that you've been a policy maker, you've been a legislator. Have a lot of the contentious issues, and not just by this government, but governments previously and increasingly so now, have a lot of contentious issues been left for the courts to deal with. Whether it was Article 377, whether it was Sabri Mala, whether it was Triple Talaq. You know, it's almost that politicians fear to tread in a region. So, okay, let the courts decide. And it's a story across the political spectrum. It's sadly true. It is sadly true that politicians and legislators have mm. conceded ground. Mm. And as a result, there is something called judicial overreach. That's right. Now, sometimes judicial overreach has done many good things. Mm. Now, you and I can agree or disagree about something like Sab Sabri Mala. True. But certainly, the Supreme Court has made many path-breaking judgments, sure. as you know about Section 377 True. and in many other ways. Mm. Now, but it has also done some very silly judgments like the he handi judgments True. and many other things. I think courts have better things to do. Mm. And also it is not a good thing for the courts to intervene. For, no, for legislatures to concede this ground mm. because mm. this is a legitimate part of the elected representative's job. And if they don't do it, and, but it's not a new thing. You go back 25 years, uh, the Supreme Court decided that there should be CNG fuel for transport in Delhi. Mm. That should have been a legislative decision or a, an executive decision, not a court decision. Courts should decide for the whole country, not for a city or for a But mola. isn't it because the government of the day perhaps wasn't Precisely. taking a call? Precisely. Yeah. We legislators mm. across the spectrum, by not, you know, by the non-functioning of parliament, mm. by the by the disruptions in parliament, mm. by not uh, agreeing to thrash out compromise solutions. We are conceding this ground to the courts. It's not a good thing. I have to ask you the ground that you're not conceding. It's been seven months that you quit the BJD. Uh, is it time to put the record straight? What happened? Uh, and, and, and many people who are wondering, will you be contesting election 2019? Are you veering towards the BJP? Are you going to form a party of your own? I think there are lots of questions. I'm sure you'll be asked these questions through the course of this book launch. So, uh, some commentators mm. had wrongly mm. accused me of having ulterior motives of quitting the BJD, mm. saying that I would join a particular party, get some position. Mm. They've been proven wrong and I think they are a little perturbed because you are right, it has been seven months. Instead of joining anybody, I've been extensively touring around Odisha, mm. discussing with the public, with other politicians and taking feedback about my decision. Mm. My decision to leave the BJD was a very difficult decision for me. It was. Uh, you know, I had been involved with it from the beginning mm. and I had fought very hard to build up the BJD's image in Odisha mm. uh, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, in Delhi mm. as, a, as a member of parliament. Uh, in the early days, it was treated as a, not a serious party. Naveen was seen as a socialite. I had to struggle very hard here to build up that, that image. Perception. And mm. I was very proud of what Naveen was doing in the initial years mm. in Odisha. Mm. He was taking very tough and bold decisions on corruption. He was sacking cabinet ministers routinely for corruption. Mm. He was having senior IS officers arrested. He mm. was having important business people arrested for corruption and was cracking down hard on crime. I was very proud of that. Has he stopped doing all of that? In the last five years, yes. In the last five years, he has mostly delegated everything to a new coterie, mm. uh, which was not involved in the building up of the party or the struggle. Mm. They have come and taken the party in a very different direction. Mm. There is a serving IS officer who is today running the party, who is collecting funds, mm. who is distributing party tickets. It's unconscionable. It's un, it's uh, yeah, you know, it's unconstitutional. Be left the no, we have seen very powerful PMOs, mm. but no officer in the PMO has ever collected funds and distributed tickets. Mm. Neither in any important chief minister's office. This is crossing all limits. But more than that, mm. the crime is shocking in Odisha. You know, nationally, mm. when you have a gruesome uh, gang rape and murder like you saw in Kathua. Mm. Uh, in JNK or in Unnao in Uttar okay. Pradesh, yeah. the national media correctly outraged over it and yeah. exposed it. But this now, is not that happens in you Odisha. You know, in Odisha, three to four such cases every week. Every week, there are three to four cases I of children. It's the tyranny of distance that kind of it's doesn't get those. It's the tyranny of distance. All the best then with your book, and we hope to hear a lot more of you in a run up to elections 2019 and as and when you crystallize your plans. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you.